Hi, I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you once again to Disciples of Faith Global Outreach, where we are reaching the world one share at a time. Uh, I'm out of town today, but I wanted to make sure that I gave you the word. I'm excited about what God is trying to do through this word today. And, and I believe that God is speaking to a whole nation today, not just uh, one group of people that we know about, but I believe that God is speaking to nations today, not even just one nation, but worldwide nations all over that the Lord is actually speaking to us and really giving us instruction concerning what we need to do, where we need to go, what our position is, and even what the message is today. You know, it's so important because so many people have so many different messages, so many ways that they are able to look at, you know, the gospel, different ways that they, you know, this is my lane, this is my focus. But I believe that what you will find with Jonah is really the heart of God. It is really where God is, how he's planning to reach the world. And the fact that God does not change. We get to see that the same God who spoke to Nineveh, that this horrible city that had was filled with sin, the same God that's speaking to us today, even speaking to us in America today. So listen, I'm going to uh, read to you out of the book of Jonah. Come on. I'm going to be reading to you out of the book of Jonah, chapter number three. I'm going to start at verse number four, end in verse number five. Again, do not hesitate to share. We certainly want you to share this video. I believe that this is going to be certainly impactful, and I'm, I'm excited about what God is doing. Excited about you hearing it, but also excited about what I believe God's doing in the hearts of people to move us to begin to actually accomplish his will in the earth. Once again, that's the book of Jonah chapter three. I'm going to start at verse number four and in verse number five. We'll stop right there, and then we'll get into the revelation. Here's how it reads. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh, this is, this is really great. The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now, Jonah here, and, and, and I want you to understand, we're at the end of our reading. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you once again for your people. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing today in the earth. We thank you even now for those that are hearing, those that are going to get this later, whenever, however they're going to receive it, whatever device they're going to receive it. God, I pray right now that there's a blessing attached to it, that there's revelation that's attached to it, and that, God, that in this, there is insight and, and, and God, a desire in your hearts of your people to change, to be motivated, to be renovated and actually got to be sent out. We bless you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's take a look at this. Jonah has learned a lesson here. We understand Jonah had been in the belly of the, of the fish that had been created for him for these three days and three nights. He's now ready to go. He has repented, at least out of his mouth. He's repented, and he has told us what he's going to do. Jonah says, I'm going to accomplish my vow. I'm going to do what you told me to do. And then Jonah then begins to set out to do that. He's learned, at least by his actions, Jonah, Jonah has learned that fighting God is futile, that resisting the will of God makes no sense. And J Jonah now is ready to go on his journey. The Bible says that Jonah gave a message. Jonah's message was, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, I, I'm positive that's not the whole message, right? That's not all the message, but that's the message that Jonah uh, actually emphasizes. You know, Jonah has good news here, that God's hand is, is stretched out toward the people of Nineveh, that God desires that none of them perish, and that his thoughts toward them are thoughts of peace, not of evil. I would imagine that they would have to believe, especially coming from someone who had been persecuted by the Ninevites, which is Jonah and the children of Israel, I'm sure they're thinking that if this is truly the God of the Israelites, nothing else here could be but punishment. There could be no other thought but revenge. There could be no other thought but retribution. Uh, and so there's some physical reparations that I'm sure they're thinking about. And so Jonah gives them a message. But I would imagine here that the scripture is not giving us the whole message. The Lord says to Jonah, he says, listen, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city, and I want you to speak to that Nineveh. I want you to preach to it is what he says. And he says, I want you to preach the words that I give you. Don't give them any other words other than my words. So we recognize that at the end of this, as you just go through the end of the book, we don't hear God ever chastising Jonah and saying, you didn't give my whole message. But what's written here 
is where Jonah's emphasis was. Jonah had the good news in his mouth, but his emphasis was on destruction. Jonah's emphasis was on overthrow. He says, yet in 40 days, the city is going to be overthrown. Now, when you begin to look at this overthrown here, it's the same word that we'll see with uh, in the book of Lamentations, where the city is being destroyed. Uh, the same overthrowing that we hear in Sodom and Gomorrah means utter destruction. So Jonah's message, his focus was on the utter destruction and not on the good news that God's hand is out. Listen, I think this is important to us because there's so many people that have a personal dog in this fight, not recognizing that this is not about you. There's so many of us that preach, but you know what? We're so angry with people who've done certain things and we've taken it personally. You're gay and that's, pers that's a personal affront to me. You know what? You've been to jail. That's a personal affront to me. You know what? You're destroying our neighborhood by being a drug dealer, by being a drug user. And that's important to me. You know, and, and it's offensive to me. And so I'm going to let you know God's going to kill you if you don't get it right. Listen, how many of us look at that and think that we're really preaching the good news? God's going to destroy you. I'm telling you right now, listen, if you don't get this thing together today, you're going to die. Listen, God is angry with you. He's got, I mean, listen, he's fed up. And we look at it and we assume, yeah, that's going to make the change. But I'm using my feelings and my emotions to have a gospel transformation, which is impossible, which is why the Lord says, listen, I want you to speak the words that I tell you. Jonah speaks the words, but he emphasizes his own words. I don't know if you've ever written or read anything where someone said, you know, emphasis mine. They, they put uh, the quotations around it, or they, they've actually put br brackets around the words and say, I put an emphasis on this. I actually made this the most important part. I was the one who said that if, if you're going to read anything, Read this, get this part, because this is the most important part. Yet God has given another reason to Jonah. He's talking about the fact that I've got people in that city. See, listen, Jonah was sure that his message was to preach the good news to people who were going to perish. Jonah was sure that his real reason and the real profit in preaching this message was that the people are going to die. But at least I did my job. There are people who go out and we go to the corners and we preach to the thugs. And our, whole, our real reason for doing it is I'm obedient to the spirit, not with any hope that they ever change, not with any hope that there's ever a turnaround. But listen, I'm just being obedient to God. I'm going through the gospel motions. I'm doing the job that I believe I'm supposed to do. And my conscience is clean, especially with knowing they're not going to listen. They're not going to heed anything. The Lord doesn't give Jonah this message. The Lord doesn't tell Jonah they're not going to heed. The reality is that Jonah hopes they don't. Jonah is sure they don't. God has confidence. He says, I have people there, yet Jonah is preaching the gospel message, never getting in line with the gospel. Jonah is preaching the gospel message, but never getting in line with the Prince of Peace. Jonah is saying the right words with a heart that's hoping for destruction, with a God that's giving hope to the people for deliverance. Jonah is preaching a message with the hope of destruction, wearing the robe of a prophet, wearing the title of a prophet, going in the name of God, yet having a mindset of destruction. Jonah says, listen, I want you to hear this. I'm telling you. And listen, I want you to get this. Jonah never preaches repentance. Jonah never mentions repentance. And listen, I get it. I get it. And, and I would imagine God doesn't put the message of repentance in there. He doesn't say, Jonah, use these words. Tell the people to repent. Why? Because truly, when you understand repentance, repentance is not really a word. Repentance is, you know, you can define it. Obviously, if you go to Webster's, there's got to be a, a definition for it. If you go to theology schools, there's going to be a definition for it. If you look in concordances, if you look through uh, Bible dictionaries, there's going to be a definition for it. But the reality is, in truth, repentance is not something that you say. Repentance is something that you do. The reality is that God wasn't looking for the people to fall down on their knees and say anything. The Lord was talking about true repentance is turning in the opposite direction 
from where you're going. Listen, there's so many people that, listen, there are people that have been baptized 16 times and repented in front of a whole crowd of people. There are people that have cried real tears, crocodile tears, but real tears, fell out, had to have de deacons and missionaries on both arms getting them up, so sorry for what they did, and went right back to it right after the music stopped. After they were dried off from the water, it didn't change anything. Repentance can be imitated by, if it's based on words. Anybody can say sorry, but the question is going to be, Do is my heart turned? Is my mind changed? And am I literally with my heart and my mind causing my body to move in the direction of my heart and of my mind? That's when things are correct. It's not what you say. So God, listen, Jonah doesn't put it in there, but the Lord never requires it because he knows. He said, I have people in that city. What does that mean? My sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. Listen, aren't you glad that, you know, deliverance and, and, and salvation isn't really based upon people? Aren't you glad that God, listen, we really think that we're in charge of it. We really believe that somehow, you know, we're responsible for it. I got to preach this word right because if I don't, people aren't going to get saved. Let me tell you something. Nobody comes to the Father unless they're drawn. We get all kinds of pats on the back and accolades. In reality, we draw no one. We have temporary drawing power. If I've got enough charisma, if I say it in the right way, if I have good enough word knowledge, if I can use words correctly, I can draw you for a moment as long as I'm in the concert, as long as I'm at the podium, as long as I'm in the, in the, in the pulpit, as long as I'm in the sanctuary, trust me. I can draw you for a moment, but your life is not going to be changed. I have drawing power, but not transformation power. I have the ability to change your mind for an instant, but not to change your life. The Lord is the only one. That's why Jonah is not responsible for this revival. God is allowing Jonah to be a part of the revival, but Jonah is not responsible for this revival. And so when you begin to look at this, here's what happened. Jonah is doing everything he can to make sure, he's doing everything he possibly can to make sure that the people stay in the position that they're in. Listen, I want you to get that. I hope you really receive that because I need you to understand the demonic attack that's going on with God's people. We are so stupid, so intellectually a bankrupt that we refuse to study the word of God and are getting other people's emotions. We're receiving other people's emotions as if that was the word of God. And we're allowing ourselves to be fooled. And the Lord says, listen, I've got people in Nineveh that don't know their left hand from their right hand that literally don't know me, that don't have a relationship with me, and yet they're my people. How? Because God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what they're going to be, but right now, even though they're his people, they have no real knowledge of him. It's a work he's done. It's a, it's a design created by him. If my people who are called by my name, get this, there are people who are called by his name right now who don't know him or his name. What do you think your job is? What do you think Jonah's job was? Listen, get these people saved. No, introduce them to the Jesus who had already loved them before they ever met him. Introduce them. Tell them who he is. Introduce his character and his nature. Listen, there's so many of us that have a tainted understanding of who he is that it really becomes impossible for us to become ambassadors. If you don't have a private audience with the president, you can't know his mandate. If you aren't in the throne room, how can you be a representative of the throne? If you have never witnessed him with the crown on his head, how can you call him majestic? How can you call him Lord if he's not Lord to you? So the reality is that Jonah was preaching a message, but get this. Interestingly enough, if all of that's there, let me tell you who misses out, Jonah. But God is not going to let a, a backwater preacher, God's not going to let some bootleg who doesn't want people to get saved to stop people getting saved. Listen, when you begin to look at some of the craziest ministry, some of the craziest preaching you've seen, some of the things that are just haywire, and you look up and you wonder, well, how is that church continually going? Why? God is preaching to people in spite of 
And I want you to get that. When the minister isn't going to do right, do you understand that we have a God who's able to take over? Take over. How in the world did 15 people get saved last week? And under that lack of anointing, because it is God who does the work. It is God who gives the increase. One plant and one waters, but God gives the increase. Check this out, though. If there's no planting and no watering, we serve a God who can bring increase without it. Listen, planting and watering is my role. It is your role. It is a role. It's a privilege that the Lord is allowing you and I to be a part of. But he created the world out of nothing. He had no tools. He needed nothing. So if I don't plant right... If I decide to hold on to the water that he freely gave me and refuse to give you the water, if I don't give you the deluge you're supposed to, but give you a trinkling, a sprinkling of the water, do you understand that the God who doesn't need planting and watering to give increase will step in and do it? God had a prophet who did not want to prophesy to the people, and in spite of him, God did it anyhow. Listen, let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says, and the people of Nineveh believe God. Listen, I want you to get that. Repentance begins with believing God. Repentance is not sorrow. And I want you to get that. You don't change and, and turn because you're sad. That's just an emotion. That's a feeling. No, no. It starts with believing God. And listen, you can't believe God without the word of God. Listen, they could not turn. Why do you think God sent them to Jonah? Jonah was looking at people and saying, What's wrong with these crazy people? Why won't they do right? How many people are in our environment right now that we're sick of, that we just have, you know, we washed our hands of them because they just won't do right. And the Lord says, how can they hear without a preacher? How do you think they're going to do right if there's no ministry? Why do you think you live next door? Why do you think you were supposed to be doing the Bible study with your... Why did you start a Bible study and only invited other saints? How come you never invited that neighbor who you think won't do right? I know why. Because you don't care if they ever do right. Why didn't you invite that person at your job who says, I'm not sure if I even believe that God exists. What do you think your Bible study was about? What do you think your ministry is about? What do you think your testimony is, for, is about? And who do you think it's for? It's for Ninevites who don't yet know that they know him. I want you to get that. Somebody needs to grab that. Jesus said, I have people there that I know. And whether you know it or not, they know me. Jeremiah, I, I, I'm just meeting you. God said, listen, no, no, no. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I spoke with you. I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. We've had a relationship. Those that he did foreknow, he did predestinate. And those he did predestinate, he called. So when you begin to look at this, there is a relationship that is connected to Christ that the uh, that people don't know about and that many of his saints are unaware of. And my job is not to be the great connector. My job is to reveal who he is so that his sheep begin to recognize the voice that they've known before the very foundation of the world. Jonah's job was revealing. And listen, let me tell you something. Here's the thing. When Jonah preached the gospel, Jonah did not, did not in any way transform these people. The Bible says, and they believe God. How? When I take in the word of God, when I hear the word of God and I believe it, what power does God give me? He gives me the power to transform my life. Get this. Paul said, listen, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? Through the washing with the water of the word of God. Get this. Paul says, I didn't say pray for transformation. Paul says, it's in you. When you got the word, he's talking to saints. He says, saints of God. Do not be conformed. You have the power to stay in the mold if you want to. You have the power to let the society mold you. You have the power if you want to just to stand still and let them make you the sculptor that they want. But he says, don't sit there and just let it happen. Once you have the word of God. Listen, you're powerless if you don't have the word of God. But the moment that the Ninevites heard God's word, 
There's some of this that I'm sure Jonah's cut out of this. They're not even focused on Jonah. They're not even looking at Jonah. Listen, you're going to make the gospel a shipwreck. Folks ain't going to get saved because of you. Listen, Jonah, I would imagine he didn't give this message with, with a smile. I'm sure he didn't come through and say, Jesus loves you. Jonah was as stern and hard as possible. I'm positive because he didn't want them saved. And guess what? They got saved. Listen, we come from traditions where people believe in the stern, hard, mean look that I ain't playing. Listen, it, it ain't, this ain't no game. And listen, we think that that's holiness, right? But check this out. Generations of generations of people got saved through those very same hardcore ministries. You picking, you got gum in your mouth and somebody smacked that gum out your mouth. You know, the ushers are, you know, that choke, grabbed you by the neck. We get used to that kind of environment, but check it out. Hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people under those conditions have gotten saved. Why? Because it's not based upon the usher. It's not really based upon deacon. It's not the elder. It, they don't do it. It is God. Do you understand that if it were not God, there, there are those of us right now who would have looked at this and said, I'm not taking that from you. Not, not the person who enslaved me. I'm not taking that from you. Not the person who stole my country. I'm not taking that from you. Not the person who was is the, the imperialist master of the world, and the, the great slaver of the world. No way. I'm not taking that from you. But because we heard it and said, that resonates in my spirit as the word of God. Not coming from him. Not coming from her. But that's the word of God. I'm not feeling him. I'm not feeling her. But I'm feeling this word. That's why... Paul told Timothy, preach the word. He doesn't tell Timothy, listen, what you need to do is get a better robe. You know what? You need to stand up taller. You need to act like this. You need to have more charisma. He said, listen, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. But wait a minute. They don't really like me, Paul. Preach the word. They think I'm too young. Preach the word. You know, and you know I'm sickly. Paul said, listen, take a little wine for your stomach, but preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Why? Because that's the only way transformation can happen. They can't hear without a preacher. Listen, there's so many people. Get in that word. What did God say? And the Lord said, listen, did I tell you, why are you asking them? Why aren't you teaching? How can they hear without a teacher? They need your ministry. We want to send people out so fast. And let me tell you something. It's not because we want them out, you know, giving the gospel so fast. Here's the reality. We get sick of them so fast. We get tired of them so fast. You're a baby. You know, it's time for you to grow up. And you don't recognize it took you eight years. Your pastor is thinking the same thing about you. You have no idea that there are leaders that are saying, how long are you going to stay here? Why are you still asking me that? How come you have to follow up with me on the thing I told you? You don't need to check with me. You need to do this. Pastor, should I pray? You know, you're asking me, should you pray? And yet you've got a, a line of folks that are now asking you the same stuff you're asking me. And you're telling me you're sick of them. You got a list of people you ready to cut off. You got a list of people. And yet every testimony. Lord have mercy. I'm so glad the missionary didn't cut me off. I'm so glad. I, Elder, I know I got on your nerves, but you always had time for me. How in the world do you think you can do it? And yet you got a list of people that you're not trying to promote. You got a list of people that you're not trying to help grow. You're not trying to make sure that you do your planting and watering. You got folks you're, right, you're trying to get rid of that you're done with. See, when you begin to look at this, I want you to get this. There's some things associated here with repentance. The, 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 the people believe God and they repented. But listen, if, if there's no trusting of the word of God, if there's no believing in the word of God, then everything else is useless. Here is a revelation. You cannot. And I want you to get this. This is really important. So you can grab hold of this. You can't believe God apart from his word. Hello. Somebody needs to grab hold of that. I felt him in my spirit. Let me tell you something. If you don't get his word Listen, that thing happened to me and I knew it had to be God. Trust me, you can have 25 near death experiences, five almost, you know, fatal accidents. And that's not the word of God. That's going to be chalked up to luck. Eventually, I mean, it's, it can be a religious feeling experience at the moment. 
But over time, unless it's the word of God, you're not trusting God. You're trusting in some type of divine providence. I know the man upstairs was looking out for me. That's not the word of God. Listen, if you knew the word of God, you would not be calling him the man upstairs. You would be calling him by his name. You would recognize that there is no other name that is made under heaven by which men must be saved. If you understood this name, you would not call him the big guy upstairs. You would know who he is and would know that demons tremble at that very same name. So there's so many people that are having emotional conversions. And I need you to get this because God is redoing some things that we messed up. You know, the song talks about, you know, you got to clean up what you messed up. Listen, this is too big for us. This is too far from us. Our denominations are too deep. You know, our traditions are too deep. You know, the Pharisees couldn't fix it on their own. You know, Nicodemus couldn't see it without being born again. And we can't fix this mess on our own. We're too tangled up in thinking our doctrine is right. Holiness, uh, apostolic, dip, you know, d d I I'm a Methodist, I'm, I'm Pentecostal. I'm di and, and very few of us really like the understanding of believer. You know, we like the word when we're with, you know, our folk. You know, my people, we dance over here. We speak in tongues over here. You know, we're educated over here. We pray over here. And we somehow think that we're separated. And these denominations have separated us. And we're having emotional moments and we're missing the word of God. Because the word of God has nothing to do with your denomination. Has nothing to do with any of those things. So the, the, the truth of the matter is, revival can't happen without repentance. Right? I mean, we, we're looking for revival all the time, but yet people aren't repenting. Look, we're looking at revival, hoping, you know, for power from God and not realizing that revival starts with people who want to turn. I don't have it because I didn't ask. What you need to do? I need to turn around. I need to turn that around. I'm sitting out here, you know, begging when, I, when I'm supposed to have. I need to turn some things around. So when you begin to look at this and what God is doing, God is trying to say, listen, let's move the emotion out of the way. And let's give some faithful preaching because unless faithful preaching misses fa message with faithful hearing, there can be no revival in Nineveh preaching came. Jonah gave the message in the craziest way he possibly could, but he gave the message. The people heard the message and guess what? The synergy began to happen and now the power began to start. And the Bible says, and the people of Nineveh proclaimed the fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Now listen, I want you to get this. Repentance means doing something. And I, 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 my hope is that you really will understand that because there's so many, there's so many people are gonna get baptized today. There's so many people that are gonna repent today and truly never repent because you don't think you have to do anything. You think, listen, so many people have gotten the message that you're so powerless, you can't do anything. There's nothing you can do. Listen, you can look unto him who is the author and the finisher of your faith. You can understand that the problem with you was that you were disobedient and now you have to be obedient. And obedient to God is never just simply saying, pray. No, the Lord says, listen, uh-uh. You my people, you need to do a couple of things. You gotta humble yourself. You're gonna need to pray. You're gonna need to seek my face. You're gonna need to turn from your wicked ways. Whoa. I've got to do something. How many people right now are languishing where they are because they, they've missed the point? That's something I have to do. That Listen, if I'm in the mud, I get out the mud by not praying about the mud. I got to back. I got to backtrack. Matter of fact, I can't even step backwards because I can't see where I'm going. I've got to literally turn around in the mud and go in another direction in the mud. That's what God is calling for right now. We are in the mud and God is saying, in the mud, turn around. Look forward and realize there's nothing in front of me. There's no way I'm going to flourish out there. In the mud, if I continue to stay in this mud, it's only going to get deeper and deeper and eventually I'll get stuck out here in the mud, stationary in this position for the rest of my life. But what God is offering me is an opportunity to miss destruction. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the Lord said, I came that you would have life and that more abundantly. So I'm giving you this message today for this very same reason. I'm offering you life by warning. 
And I want you to get that there's so many of us that are missing, you know, the good news is that it's all okay. No, the good news is that it's horrendous, that it is terrible, and that judgment is coming, and there's a way you can miss it. Listen, there's so many people that saw the vaccine as good news. You know, the good news wasn't was was simply listen. There's a way you can escape. This isn't a commentary on the vaccine because I'm not telling anybody what to do in terms of the vaccine. But I want you to understand the good news is that won't kill you. That won't hospitalize you. That won't deform you. The plan of the virus is to kill you. But I've come with a greater than Johnson & Johnson, with a greater than Moderna or Pfizer, I've come with something that will literally vaccinate you unto eternal life. That's the beauty of this. But they had to do something. So what did the people do? They fasted. They mourned. And they, they put on sackcloth. Now, what's the sackcloth about? When you look at what they did, they mourned as if there was a death. They, they recognized something's got to die. Something's got to die. And they read, you know, you know what the interesting thing was? They recognized it was them. They, were, they put on grave clothes as if they were dying because they realized in order for me to live, I've got to die to this mess. I've got to die to this way of living. I, listen, the way I'm going to show God that, that literally that I'm dead to this is that I'm going to now have the right mindset about my sin. I'm going to look at my past correctly. Listen, there's so many people that are trying to move to the next dimension while glorifying your sin. You got on, you got on celebration clothes when God said, listen, you need to have on grave clothes. You need to have on sackcloth and ashes. Do you realize how far you are from where you're supposed to be? Do you know how disobedient you have been? Do you realize how close you came to death? Yes, celebrate that I'm here, but I need you to have the right mindset about where you were or you'll go back. Listen, anything you celebrate, you can go back to. As long as you celebrate immorality, trust me, it's right around the corner. As long as you celebrate promiscuity, it's right around the corner. As long as you celebrate illegal uh, relationships, listen, a illegal, illegal relationship is right around the corner. Until you look at it and realize that thing was trying to kill me. I see it now as God sees it. Listen, I want you to get this. When you begin with true repentance is now seeing what God is seeing. And listen, everything that God is seeing is not, you know, this, this heavenly picture. God is saying, listen, I need you to deal with you. I need you to mourn over your big mouth. I need you to mourn over that rebel that's in you. I need you to mourn over the fact that you, you lose it from time to time, that you think that that's cool and be my people and living like that. I want, listen, I want you to lament the fact that you assimilated, that you become just like everybody else, that there's nothing different or new about you. There's nothing special about you, that the shine and the glow that I placed on you is literally dulled by you wanting to be like everybody else. This isn't crazy. This isn't like, you know, somebody came and, and, and it sucked you in. You desire not to be special. You don't want to look like you're anointed. You really are doing everything you can do to cover up who you are and your identity. And the people of Nineveh recognize, stop, this cannot continue. When I'm in repentance, it's not business as usual. There are people that are really going on and saying, woo, it was tight, but it's right. And you think that you're supposed to go on like business as usual? Absolutely not. They believe God. And listen, let me tell you something. They focused their faith. This was the faith that they were looking and saying, I'm placing my faith in the God of Israel. I believe him. Not, listen, not just fear of judgment. They believed God. What does that mean? They didn't just fear that God was going to destroy him. No, they believed in him. They heard that good news that Jonah may not have wanted him to hear. So when you begin to look at this, when they heard this word, the response was unanimous from the lowest to the highest. And listen, it appears, and I want you to get this, it appears that the revival started from the lowest to the highest. The king hears about it after they get it. The people, when they hear the message, they don't wait for the leader to do it. They don't wait and say, well, listen, I can't wait for you to call a revival for next week. Listen, pastor, I, listen, I, you, we need to start prayer meeting because the church needs to pray. No, they looked and said, I need to pray. I need to get myself together. Listen, I'm not waiting on, you know, two months from now that the revival's coming in January. No way. They said, I need revival now. So from the lowest to the greatest, they began to put on sackcloth and ashes. They didn't ask permission. They didn't need a committee. You know, they began to do it themselves. 
repentance was underway, already happening as soon as the king heard it. And when he heard it, he now made a decree. He said, everybody's going to do it. No need for a decree, but he wanted to make sure. I'm going to make sure that everybody gets this. Every, every, I want to make sure it's, it comes from the top, a royal decree. So when you begin to look at this, this was an issue of not, they didn't have enough information. This was an issue of motivation. They got it. They, they received the information. And listen, there's so many of us that are in the same position right now. It, I, I, I don't have it. I, I don't get it. No way. No way. We're in a sea of knowledge now. We live in a sea of knowledge. So it's not a lack of information that's there. If somebody would have told me, you know, I, I don't have adequate knowledge of God. If I had known, you know, I'm going to blame that on my Sunday school teacher because they didn't tell me. Listen, you better start working out your own salvation with fear and trembling because the Bible doesn't say, pastor, make sure they study to show themselves approved unto God. No, the Bible says you are to study to show yourself approved unto God that you are a workman. Do you want to get to work? Because there's so many people that look at that and say, well, that's not for me because I'm a bench warmer. I'm not even trying to get into the game. Lord, don't call my number. Matter of fact, let me cover up. Listen, there's people on the bench who like to talk. So those guys aren't even thinking about ever getting in the game. You know, they're sitting on the bench and it's really just like, yeah, it, that's my friend right here. So they're talking to people on the bench. They're talking to people in the stands. They have no desire to get into the game, but they like being on the team. So when the team wins, they get to jump up and they take the picture with the team and they might hoist up the trophy with the team as if they really did anything. But when you look at this, God is saying from the, I mean, the, the guy who from the lowest portion on the team to the captain of the team, to the coach of the team, they were already there. They were already repenting. They received this knowledge. They recognized I have the knowledge. What I didn't have was the desire to do it. And that word of God, connected with their desire and then all of a sudden they begin to repent and listen i want you to understand something i believe that that's what god wants to do with our nation today i really believe that if, if the nation hears this word that if, if, if the right people in this world and if we recognize this doesn't start in washington from the least to the greatest it starts in your house it starts in what you're going to do in your neighborhood it starts in our community it doesn't start with the mayors and the governors. It doesn't start with the, the, the House of Representatives or the Senate. It doesn't start with the president. It starts with you recognizing where you are. It starts with a revival in your town. It starts with a revival in your neighborhood. It starts with a revival in your living room. That's what's going to happen. So when you begin to look at this, I want you to begin to see here what God is really doing and what he's determining what's happening. With Nineveh. And, and I want you to get this. And I'm going to close out right here because I think this is really important. God gives uh, Jonah a command. Warn the people. Why? Because I'm so sick of them. So, so upset about their sin. No. Jonah gives a warning to the people because God wants them to repent. He knows. And listen, without a warning, that there's no reason that the, there's no hope for the people to actually get out of what they're in. That's the love of God. The, the warnings that we receive is the love of God. You can't come out unless I tell you that you're in it and what it's trying to do with you. Imagine if, if God had sent Jonah in with this word about the fabulous future that was there. And listen, there's so many people that are missing what God is doing. He's warning a nation right now. He's warning a people right now. And I hope that you get off of this, this, this place of trying to placate people, trying to, to, to pet up people and recognize that God is in full warning mode for this purpose. If, I, if the nation would hear me, I'd spare that nation. But if that nation does not hear me, I will not spare that nation. If Jonah had given this message without the warning, they would have been utterly destroyed. If Jonah had come and said, hey, it's okay. You know, God's not through with you yet. You can continue doing what you're doing. It's fine. They would have been absolutely destroyed. But the city's inhabitants heard the warning and they were humble. And they decided right there, we're going to change our ways. And the city was spared. Listen, there were some beautiful results that came from what happened here in this word. I want you to understand that that's the message that God is giving. I'm going to say this emphatically because I really believe it. That's the message that God is giving to this nation. I want you to look at this nation. And listen, this is global outreach, right? Disciples of faith, global outreach. But my focus today is really not the globe. My focus today is America. Why? 
because God has raised up somebody right now in Japan. God's got someone who's speaking exactly what I'm saying right now in Kenya, right now, in, 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 in the capital, in, in Nairobi. Somebody's preaching this word right now. In Bengal, I, I, I promise you, in Sri Lanka, I promise you that God is raising up someone in China right now. I promise you that is speaking this very same thing. And with time difference, they spoke it in, in, in Australia before I did. So the reality is we are synchronizing. God is getting his people. That's why this is so important that you will hear it. Stop playing the game. Stop, stop, stop looking at sin and listen, recognizing being sick of it is not your issue. You're not sick from it. I want you to look at your patients and recognize they're getting sick from this. They're getting sick from girl, girl to girl, guy to guy. They're getting sick of it. They're getting sick from it. They're getting sick and our society is getting sick from it. And we're moving further away from God. The warning is happening. The warning is being delivered. And I'm warning, I'm sending out this warning right now. And that's why this is so important that we share these messages, that we get these out because the warning is there. And God is about, listen, when he, when that part of the, that, that uh, Jonah gave that he was focused on, he gave a time frame. It's going to be short. It's, a, it's not a long time before the city is going to be overthrown. I want you to understand, we're in a very short time. We, we, listen, America is not what it used to be. The place that we're living is not what it used to be. We're divided in a place that is not just cerebral, it's physical. We're in a physical place where we're going to physically see the division. There was a physical action that happened on January 6th in the Capitol, an insurrection. There are physical things that are happening in our cities where we're just killing each other left and right, where violence is at, a, at an all-time high. It's physical. It's happening right now. And in the midst of this, the word is not kumbaya. The word is not, I promise you, it's going to get better. God's got a plan. In the midst of this, what the enemy is trying to do, God's going to turn it around. No, the warning that I'm giving to America and that I hope that you will share and give to your friends and tell them is that the revival is not going to start at the top. The revival is going to start in the homes. And if the people don't receive the warning, if we continue to play the games, if we continue to call ourselves Christians and yet operate as business as usual, then there's going to be utter destruction of what we know. Listen, our allegiance is not to this flag. I want you to understand something. God was saying to the people of Nineveh, listen, if you want to be a Ninevite, if your allegiance is to Nineveh, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. But what I can promise you what will not be destroyed, who will not be destroyed are my people. Pharaoh was overthrown. But the Bible says, you know who came out of Egypt? A mixed multitude. There's a mixed multitude, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Native, Native American. There are all manner of people that are in this country right now that I'm speaking to. And I'm saying to you, let's start the revival right where you are. Listen, that's the word of God today. And I hope you receive that. I hope you get that. And I hope you share. I hope you get serious, though, about what's coming. Because the message of the prophet was that destruction is coming. The message of the prophet was warning and the message of God in that warning was good news. There's still time. There's still a chance and my hand is still out. Listen, I hope you received this word. I hope you were blessed by this word. And listen, I want you to pray for me today, for my wife and I, because we're, we're heading back uh, to Delaware. But I'm, I just want to make sure no matter where I am, that I'm going to be here and want to be faithful to give you this word. And God gave this word because I think it's so important that we have a nation on the brink, and it may perish, but God's people and his word will survive the storm. Get on the boat. It's time. Listen, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you right now for a spirit of repentance, not even, not cerebral repentance, but God, that your people will wake up and operate differently, live differently, turn their lives around, speak differently, but God are motivated and moved to give your gospel. God, we just thank you right now that there are Ninevites all over the place, that there's still yet time, that God, that there's still a use for us, that Jonah didn't recognize that he had the privilege of carrying your word. And God, we just thank you right now that we have the privilege of carrying your word. And Nineveh was the only Gentile city that ever had a, a national revival. God, that there are cities out there right now in this country that need a national revival and you have Jonas waiting in the wings to do that work. Send them now, motivate them now, empower them now and God cause them to look in the mirror and desire not only transformation for them, 
but through the word of God, transformation for others. God bless you. And I want you to have an awesome Sunday.